Hello and welcome to Onlinescape. I'm sitting here with Joe Cornish, uh, who we've been catching up with over the last few days with a few walks around the Scottish mountains. Uh, Vidyan Nambian yes. yesterday. Uh, and a bit of scrambling up Gearanic. Um And I haven't seen you for quite a while because you've, you've been travelling for a while. Yes, uh, Antipodes uh, in April this year, lucky me. Yeah, and uh, via trips to Egg and uh, is it Asint or Torridon? Could it both? Uh, Asint's on, on, yeah, sort of on the way back really yeah. from, uh, from Down Under. So yeah. we're looking today at some of your photographs taken on your uh, Antipodes trip with, is it Christian Fletcher and... Steve Gosling. Steve Gosling. Yes, yeah, uh, but also saw several other friends out there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it was sort of part holiday, part uh, part work. Okay. Were you there? How long were you there for? About a month. A month. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we're going roughly from like, Australia to New Zealand, I think, looking at these pictures. Yes. So starting off, uh, started off actually flying into Melbourne and uh, getting collected by my dear friend Richard White and um, spending a few days with with him. Which included uh, the first picture that we're looking at, which yeah. is of, uh, from the summit of Mount Stirling, which is in the Victoria High Country. Rather wonderful location. It almost looks like snow in the background, but I know you've told me it's not, isn't it? Well, it isn't. No, it's an um, interesting range of hills, actually, this, because I mean, just to put it into perspective, these are as high as the Scottish mountains. Wow, yeah. Um, and I know there's this uh, front range in the back of the picture, just not quite sharp because this is shot with a. Um, medium format view camera uh, but with no uh, with no movements so uh, and it's strange textures look like snow as you say Tim but in fact it's burned out eucalyptus are these from previous forest fires presumably is yeah it? Yes. and I'm sure that anyone in the UK um, and elsewhere has been listening over the last decade to news from Australia and that infrequently includes forest fire mm, very, um, very dry droughts and very extreme weather they've been experiencing, but saying that the eucalyptus uh, forest, of which is predominant in this part of Australia, is also very susceptible to f to fire, and and it is part of its life cycle. Yes. Uh, so, but you know, just uh, curiously, not, uh, not necessarily a bad thing like this, some of the Tasmanian fires that have been going through. Uh, well, you know, even in Tassie, which uh, euc it's eucalypt, um, it, it is part of it. But I, I think the trouble is that as as the climate warms, so the extremes get greater, um, and that means that the fires become stronger. Uh, so anyway, you can see in the distance the eucalypts as sort of ghost trees, really. Yes. And curiously, these are uh, so-called snow gums, um, so that there's several different uh, eucalyptus types, um, and, and this particular type is the one you find high up on the hill. Um, and actually look like snow here but yes. I think it isn't actually because of that it's because of the fact that close up they've got this wonderful texture which include lots of white in it and then the foreground is is a, uh, a ground um, growing shrub and it looks like a juniper actually I'm not sure if it is maybe a close relation it does look like juniper yeah, does, doesn't yes. it yeah. which also got burnt out in the last fire um, so uh, yeah that's an interesting spot for sure and um, the, the top of Mount Stirling is is uh, is also covered in these granite uh, outcrops or boulders, uh, which are, are very interesting. Yeah, so are these places quite accessible? Are they accessible? Do you need um, to walk away to get? You, to you bet they're accessible. You can actually drive to the top. Ah, okay, yeah. right. And I have to say that's a uh, well, it's a bit of a luxury, isn't it? Um, but uh, we actually did camp up there in um, okay. quite chilly conditions, and um, and that meant that we we could get up for dawn the following morning and so on but uh, in actual fact the best uh, best conditions really were, were in the evening uh, I also made this image uh, from up there and you can see more of the scorched out eucalyptus this is rather fairy tale like isn't it it's got a uh, sleeping beauty style forest going on yeah I, I do I do really like that aspect of it and there's a sort of apparent tunnel Yes. as well appearing in the foreground um, you see the rest of the range in the distance here uh, as well uh, and it, it, this time the, the main focus uh, I placed it a little bit further back and this is the technical point but with a 35mm lens on the medium format camera uh, you can stop down and gain depth of field um, but if we, we look close at the foreground um, there's a significant loss of, of detail there but it, does it matter? I don't think it does um, it's just 
it is what it is yeah. and um, it's a very very three dimensional uh, kind of spatial um, arrangement so the, using a tilting lens wouldn't necessarily work that well there anyway no and you've made a, a black and white you showed me a black and white version of this which is quite dramatic and it's uh, yeah, I, mean, so, I think it worked very differently uh, well uh, so there it is in black and white and you know without having done any manipulation of the color channels it it immediately does come across differently I think if I were going to pursue that idea I'd probably make it a little bit darker mm. um, because it lends itself more to then pure mood and emotion. Sorry about that. Um, let's just that's the vignetting. Probably a good good place to start. Yeah. Um, and immediately it, it becomes more a little bit more sort of haunted. Yes. Uh, and perhaps more in keeping with the nature of the picture. And I was very conscious of of it being a, a co contrast in a way with the uh, life in the foreground, the you know fresh flowers and and the starkness of the burnt out forest. Incidentally, um, if anyone's interested in the habitat here, um, the recovery is very fast. So this is very, very recent um, uh, destruction. Um, but even so, you can see the beginning of, of the uh, the recovery process around the base of the eucalypt. Yeah. So we'll just go back to the color for a second. Um, and see, uh, yeah, you can see the quite vivid yes. colour of the leaves reappearing, and they're very, very, very tough trees. They're very beautiful, I think, very spectacular. So the tree survives, and does it, or is it just new trees? You could growing? say that the tree itself does, in fact, survive because it comes up from the existing right. um, yeah. body of the tree, uh, and, and some trees, you know, they will recover at least partially uh, within the tree itself. It just depends on the heat of the fire uh, at any particular spot. So. After uh, stay with Richard, I flew to Tasmania, uh, so to Hobart from Melbourne, and stayed with uh, the lovely Crawth Crawford family, uh, Cam and Helen. Uh, Cam was uh, a early winner of the Peter Dombrowskis Memorial uh, Award, and uh, he actually assisted me for a couple of weeks in the, in the UK about fifteen years ago, maybe longer. Right. Now. Um, lovely guy and uh, really really interesting. Um, smashing family um, so Cam took me around and showed me some of his favourite haunts including this spot which is Denny's Point some on fabulous Green geology Line. going oh yeah there. you bet yeah really really stunning wonderful um, this is essentially a, a kind of shale I think and on top of that it's sitting this um, I think it's a metamorphosed limestone but there's clearly some kind of heat process has been going on that has um, split the uh, the country rock here um, and so, yeah, this is a high tide with a little bit of water movement you can see it's a one second exposure here uh, on ISO 50 which is the lowest uh, ambient ISO of a phase yes. one back um, another place that I went to with Cam is Mount Field National Park in Tasmania it's north of Hobart and this is a really fascinating area in fact all of the uh, the the wilderness area to the north and northwest of Hobart uh, is old growth forest um, and although the biggest trees in the wood are eucalypts this is a myrtle uh, which is a sort of a funny sounding name and I, it's not a tree I'm at all familiar with and I assume it's a southern hemisphere only tree yeah but this this one is 70 meters high it's a large so tree. You, you can't really get a perspective on it. Um, you know, and in a way, a little bit, when, when you go to California, if you, if you do, are uh, lucky enough to go to see the giant redwoods or the coastal redwoods, that, you, you know, it's absolutely gobsmackingly amazing to walk through uh, in these forests. And the, the lovely thing about um, this part of the Mount Field National Park is although it's near a, a well-known um, spot, uh, you could say it's a, it's a, it's a big kind of cave system called growling swallow but hardly anyone goes there so you have it to yourself yeah and uh, you walk through this remarkable forest and uh, and these trees are everywhere yeah. all of a, a similar maturity and and size including some that have fallen and that's where the clue comes to the size because you can you can walk on top of them yeah you know and you know two or three cricket pitches later you're thinking when is this <laughs> going to end it's just amazing 
Uh, so we it's quite lucky it was it's fairly soft light uh, done a little bit of processing on this one but not much um, and again actually it's probably another one that might benefit from a, a black and white conversion um, and it does yeah, looks good yeah yeah it's the sort of thing that i i would probably favor that way it sort of helps to unify moderates the light a little bit mm -hmm. yes yeah it's, of course it's an impossibility technically isn't it shooting into that kind yes. of light you are surely always going to get burned out highlights as you can see uh, from that but does it matter well i think it, it's part of the language that you can you can learn to exploit in a way um the i mean technically it would fail at the first hurdle at a, an rps assessment day but um it's still i think something that you can use and i think if you you just accept that white is, is a connotation of pure light yeah. and don brodsky's got away with it so much even on even on transparency film so it's as a matter of interest, though, Peter's uh, lenses would have been earlier models, probably less effective coating. Yes. And in many ways, one of the problems uh, that we have today is that lenses are so good. Too contrasting. They're A, too contrasting, and B, they don't have much in the way of luminous, of kind of luminous flare. Yeah. Is that the right yeah, term? Nice. Yeah. So let's have a quick look here. It's uh, veiling flare, I think. Veiling yeah. flare, yeah. that's it. Um, sometimes I feel a little bit of minus clarity here already. Um, so let's just take it off that doesn't make a lot of difference there but if we let's go up into this top part of the canopy and um, move the clarity slider left can you see that sort of things yeah. to reduce the contrast a little yeah. bit still there's still detail and that's some of what an old le uncoated lens would have done yeah well, we'll take it to the right as a matter of interest to see what happens with clarity you can see why most people actually prefer clarity but this is a uh, this is an example I think of where um, you could actually use a mixture and perhaps take some detail out at the top and, and perhaps increase the clarity at the bottom and that would maybe enhance the spatial separation between the two. I, I wouldn't do that with colour but I might consider it in monochrome. Yeah. So still in Australia we're going to move to a few Sony uh, A7R2 uh, exposures. This is at, at Denny's Point again and uh, just, just a wonderful area. Um, fascinating there's quite a lot of it um, is, this, is this a large area well uh, I've, I've, I've got an image back in the unchosen ones which shows that it's uh, it's actually it runs along the side of the of the island but this particular sort of geologically exposed zone yeah. runs from the beach and then there's about 200 meters of it yeah. max so um, not not huge no I like the almost the effect of a, um, a, a floor almost like a, a warehouse floor feel to it uh, so it's, it looks like it could be something put in the corner of a warehouse waiting for collection it's, right. uh, it's, 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 it's very open space to it you've got a very fertile imagination I have that's indeed, impressive. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, if we look closely here uh, you can see this fascinating folds which give a slight illusion as it were of being overturned um, and in fact that very crisp there um, and uh, I think if we look in here, we can see it's also very crisp, and that's because it was shot with a, a tilting, uh, well, tilting adapter. Yeah. So an old fifty millimeter, forty year old fifty millimeter nickel uh, lens. F1. And this is this is the Kipon adapter you have. Yeah. There, yeah. If we look at the top, it'll probably be a bit soft. Softer. It's, it's not, not too much. bad, but it still works pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a Kipon adapter. But it's not that expensive. It's like a good value, aren't they? Yes. One hundred and twenty pounds, I think, for. Uh, uh, and I mean, if you're using if you are a compact system camera user say Fuji and uh, Sony uh, or Panasonic or Olympus um, it's an easy way of then adapting older heritage lenses yeah. Canon and Nikon with manual aperture control yeah and, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's good fun good fun uh, okay so still on Bruni Island this is right in the south end of the island and the, the, there's it's amazing giant kelp forests just offshore uh, in Tasmania and yeah, the big storms that particularly run up from the southern ocean there rip them up from time to time and on a beach like this huge boulder beach uh, at the southern end of Bruni uh, the, there's the remains of, of these giant kelts and they are enormous and they are like leather uh, like leather well they're like uh, okay, what do you call it Pelts, um, yeah, you strip seal, an animal. Seal hide, yeah, hides. Hides, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and, and there is a, there is quite a strong similarity with seal in a way. Perhaps it's partly because it's a marine animal of that area as well. And that, and that one, I, I think, um, that's maybe the twenty four millimeter lens. So um, the depth of field there is just natural depth of field. A little bit softer in the distance. You can see the breaking wave there. Um, that I, I think I used a four stop ND just to slow things down, to soften and emphasize the effect of. Out of interest, field. which NDs are you using? Um, that's a new Lee a new IRD, is yes, it? The new the plus, the plus ones, ones, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The They're very, very good. Very yeah. good yeah. Um, and then more seaweed here. This There's is wonderful colors in these, aren't they? Very close up. Yeah, quite quite cool isn't it it's just this yeah. is all part of that same kelp forest uh, byproduct but these are much much smaller examples and you just notice in here these really odd patterns it's like gold filigree that appear and they are left i think by some well i think it's some form of snail or, something. or other little yeah. animals running around i've got a better example just coming up in a second let's just take that back to viewing distance and um this one, which in quite soft light, hence the blueness on the granite, which is uh, it's a reflection of the sky. But uh, if we go in close here, you can see this amazing detail. And it, it is like gold. It's not exaggerated. I, I have it. I bumped up saturation a little bit, admittedly, but that is the colour um, of this deposit. It looks like a Hermes handbag design or something with a gold, with a gold stitching. It's I'll, very, I'll try, very attractive. I'll try, yeah, I'll try to take that as a compliment. I'm yeah, not it sure is a compliment. <laughs> so, um, let's see, that's also shot with a, with a good old uh, 24 to 70 zoom there. And then back on uh, Dennis Point, I, I kept going back there. I, you know, Cam lent me his car, which is a typical kind of Aussie American type of thing. You know, people are so generous. They, you go, can you imagine? Would you lend me your car? You probably wouldn't. Well, you no. shouldn't. <laughs> but anyway, um, I always think that's that's a, a fascinating kind of cultural difference yes. between old world, new world mentality. Uh, and then I think finally uh, in Australia, in in Tassie, uh, back in Mount Field uh, National Park, this is a, a detail from a eucalypt. Don't, I'm not sure if this might well be a snow gum, actually. It's a, yeah, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's quite something. And I'm quite pleased to say that was handheld. And um, I, I, it's the sort of thing I, I would never have done, in, in the, even until the quite recent past, and still I started working with Mark Littlejohn and realised that there was a lot to be gained by, well, I think being more uh, intuitive, more instinctive from time to time, and just letting yourself play more. Um, yeah. So, yeah, shot with a... 24 to 70. Um, uh, I think the main reason I was having to shoot handheld is that we were running out of time. So, right. um, yes. yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, really it have works, to it? I think it would. So it's okay. Yeah, I could make a little print with that probably. Okay, so that that was that was that, and um, and then uh, so uh, I mean just a very quick tale. After I left Tasmania, I went to Sydney, met up with a dear friend of mine from many 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 years ago. Um, Chris Jones and also my brother Nick who flew over from uh, New Zealand and um, we went and saw my nephew playing in a uh, the Sydney Recital Hall um, uh, Mozart bassoon concerto I have to say that because it's just it's fantastic enjoying the reflected glory yeah. um, of seeing my very talented nephew on the stage um, so it gave me a chance to visit Sydney and then Nick and I uh, flew back to Dunedin and so from that point we're in New Zealand yes and then in New Zealand for, for two weeks so in New Zealand uh, I, as you uh, suggested earlier I met up with Kristen Fletcher and Steve Gosling and Steve is a UK based photographer I think he's appeared in with the the featured landscape. Steve, he has yes, he absolutely. Um, and uh, he's, he's a wonderful teacher and Kristen's an amazing photographer very very talented Australian Western Australian based photographer and we had a, a lovely group of 11 uh, who we essentially did a, um, a sort of New Zealand, uh, Southern Island, uh, South Island highlights to which included Mount Cook. Uh, so this is the highest mountain in New Zealand uh, here, uh, which is 12, 12 and a half thousand feet. So it puts us uh, sort of Scottish yeah. uh, mountains into perspective. And this is uh, essentially right at the end of their summer. So that also puts it into perspective. Yes, it's probably alpine. 
Yeah, um, exactly. So a lot of that snow never melts, and uh, that might be a little little bit of fresh snow just on the high mountain there. Um, this picture uh, was made at uh, sunrise one morning. The uh, the all of us uh, in the group, all fourteen, had walked out uh, for over half an hour to a viewpoint overlooking um, this glacial lake um, and quite excited to go there and my heart sunk when we got up onto the onto the sort of high moraine uh, that we were climbing and were confronted by this long lateral moraine with Mount Cook kind of hidden a couple of miles in the distance yes. behind it. Well, not hidden, but uh, yeah. you can see that it, it, what happens visually is that the whole landscape is completely dominated if you are hoping to photograph Mount Cook um, by the uh, the head, well, the, it's like a head wall, but it, it's not really a head wall, it's a, yeah. it's a lateral moraine wall, but it forms a barrier. And that barrier is both kind of visual and metaphoric, I think it, may, it's, it, it really is impossible to work work around and of course we were there we had to be positive and and sort of encourage everyone make you know enjoy yourself photographically see what you can do with it some people probably quite wisely opted for longer lenses and you know would have focused in perhaps on this um, area at the top um, but then the problem with that is it becomes very one-dimensional yes uh, so you know I'm very interested in images that convey depth and space and so it's difficult to do that um, the, the kind of uh, takeaway, uh, if you will, from that is that um, after uh, after that, that morning shoot, uh, you went back to the hotel, had breakfast, then, um, and we were then leaving to head further south. And while I was packing up, I went out onto the balcony of my hotel room, and that was what I saw. So uh, if we just go to single view a second. Um, I kind of realised that we've probably all been better up off just staying going right to the, yeah. It does have a lot nicer context to it and recession. It's actually fascinating though too, isn't it? You, we were a lot further back mm. from from the mountain uh, to make this picture. If we look, um, we so that morning we'd driven through this beautiful plain. You just make out the oh, road yes, yes. there, driven down here to the left and to the parking area which is somewhere along here just beyond this point yep. and climbed up onto this oh, wow. moraine and just further along out to, just had a picture on the left yep. um, to get closer to um, as we'd hoped a, a kind of a better perspective and, and actually of course it didn't didn't quite work out that way interesting Mount Cook actually looks like it it has more presence in this picture than the other one it, well it does and yeah. uh, we can go back to multi-view and see them together um, but this one shot with a 35 millimeter lens on a medium format, which is yep. equivalent to about 23, and that shot with an 85 mil yeah. on uh, yeah. on uh, 35 mil. Um, so yeah, and um, but I think that yeah, well, it's an obvious lesson in how perspectives are everything really mm -hmm. uh, for that kind of photography at least. And early mornings aren't necessary. No, <laughs> well, I think it probably would have been quite nice with that light. Actually, it could have been it, yeah, absolutely yes. Yeah, so whatever, uh, yeah. but it, it works okay with uh, with that light, and uh, maybe this would have been rather too dark uh, had it been like that. So it was what it was. Okay, um, looking at these uh, while I was in Dunedin with brother Nick. Um, we went to the world famous Muraki Boulders, mm -hmm. and I mean it's a. It, this is not a particularly, uh, what's the word, uh, iconic uh, sort of composition of, of the boulders because uh, it was so kind of hectic with people. Was it I, very busy? It was busy. I, you know, there were scores of people, and it was. It felt like a tourist event. And mm. the, what can you say? I mean, it was. It, it was a, a weekend, and even though the weather was overcast, and I'd been, we'd been speculating, oh, maybe it'll be okay because. You know, weather's not really nice. It was spitting with rain, yeah. but there was still tons. Didn't of stop anybody. No, yeah. and isn't it the the case? You know, we live in a world where travel is very is in, inexpensive, and uh, it opens the world. And, and we're all fortunate to travel, so clearly one can't moan and complain about about the fact there are other people there. But um, the the fact is, it, it makes it harder to concentrate, and it obviously limits your opportunities unless you actually want to make a picture of people swarming around yes. all over the boulders. Yeah. So, 
that's um, that was that. I quite like uh, one or two aspects of this composition though, and one of them is is this um, because this bog standard herring gull sat there did pretty well. If you notice the exposure time down here, six seconds. seconds. So it was a very nice bit of posing. Did he hypnotise it before he took the photo? <laughs> no, it just seemed to be completely in its own. A very zen seagull. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, back to our tour. Um, the very first morning, uh, we we were in Queenstown. Uh, we took the group out to the Coronet Peak range and, um, and photographed this view over, uh, well, towards the Remarkables, which are the you just catch a little glimpse of them here. That's a good name, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's, it's a well-named mountain range. Uh, but most of it's under cloud. And here's snow showers moving mm. across the Shotover Valley in the foreground. And cast a sugar-like snow sprinkles over the foreground as yeah. well, which is yeah. wonderful. Can't beat that, can you? Just there. But, you know, what's curious and interesting to me about this is how this very, very altered landscape, uh, this is not native New Zealand bush. Yeah. This is because Europeans have occupied this landscape for a hundred and more years and they've utterly changed it. Now there may well have been um, forest clearance by the Maori population before, but in the meantime, young Europeans have arrived, they brought poplar particularly yeah. um, and other trees that we recognise as being very, very characteristic. Of Am I right in saying New Zealand doesn't have any deciduous trees? So anything that starts to get a hint of autumn is probably non-native. Uh, you're right. Uh, not sure if that's because they're not deciduous, but because uh, they do look quite broadly. But, oh, okay. but you're right that they don't lose their... They're green. Yeah. So uh, Totara, Totara, for example, um, Pukaki, is it? And uh, there's a couple of other... Anyway, I don't know yeah. the species, but yeah, they don't get... They're evergreens. Yeah. So yeah. whether they're evergreen, coniferous or, or not, I'm not sure. So the, in fact... I mean, from a purely sort of selfish, scenic point of view, the the appearance of these European species is in an enhancing effect. Yes. Because yes, they do. And it so. looks, and it looks. I mean, to me, like Tuscany, a sort of Italian. Um, it, in fact, it's quite Tuscan because it's well, let's say quite Italian because you, you absolutely right. It has this sort of Tuscan appearance in the foreground, and then the background could almost be like the the um, Dolomites or yeah. something. So. Um, but yeah, it is actually pure New Zealand in fairness. Beautiful Arcadian landscape. Yeah, the um, we might, if we have time, just come back to this at the end. You look at the next image here, uh, which shows it basically extends the composition on this side, um, shot with the same focal length of the zoom at the time, um, and I think I was struggling with um, with with this area, which I've actually darkened down greatly in post production. Uh, and 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 also thinking, oh, this this e echo of the of the of the range is, is really nice. So you get this one, two, three, four diagonal lines, and then that's echoed and picked up by the the, the line of the road, yes. um, and clearly an occupied landscape. But but then after I'd shot it and was was editing session editing later, looking at that, thinking, but that's lovely, the snow falling on that side. So in the end check the focal lengths and found that they are indeed the same focal lengths and blended the two together so and there's only a few seconds between them there is and uh, so if we have time let's go to the, okay. the photoshop file at the end so um and then this very probably uncharacteristic little detail um is made uh, up on the uh, ridge above queenstown uh, it's actually looking down uh, towards uh, lake one uh, not one like a lake wakatipu uh, which is above Queenstown and in a way it's an ex a sample picture of a, an image that came from frustration because I found being in Queenstown very difficult um, it was it's very it's very civilized quote-unquote very urbanized yeah. and all of the landscape around it appears to have been changed by human occupation and it's kind of it just stressed me out rather um, everything we, we we went up the mountain behind the uh, uh, the mountain behind Queenstown itself on the cable car and when we got there there was lots of commercial activity there was a um, there was a kind of a, a wheeled luge run for 
for, for tourists and okay. there were there were walks through the forest and everything had been kind of organized and I was I was in my sort of wild man frustration <laughs> mode so I just walked up the back of the mountain with with a few of the others who were wanted a real workout um, and we had finally got out above all of that onto um, what was in fact a path but a very rough path and right at the top of the hill you know, I was still looking for things that would photograph well as landscapes but in the end my favorite picture was this one which is a very kind of just a close-up I, li I like the instant feel that it must be you must be looking slightly up with the blue sky with the clouds in it that's um, slightly spatially ambiguous it's it actually really, looking down yes. yeah but that helps from a color point of view because these blues are actually uh, a very similar tonality to the greens and the yellows so mm. they form a strong color chromatic contrast rather than tonal contrast which I think helps given the fact that it's got a soft and the mood is soft shot at f4 so quite wide um, and, and and that's the the emotion that I was trying to convey so that is a very quick summary yeah. of the images I made well, thank you very much uh, you're welcome um, do we have time for yes we'll take a quick look at the, the uh, joined file I think if we minimize that and um, boot this up in Photoshop uh, and uh, you and I and most people probably still use Photoshop for printing with um, and it still remains the sort of uh, most powerful editing software really yeah. um, for, for print finishing um, and you can see there the two stitched images so it combines for me the best of both um, there's no kind of dissonance really I didn't feel uh, between the two because they shot very close uh, together in time but it does raise the question, which we were discussing earlier, um, that uh, is it legitimate to uh, make images in this way uh, where we, we're actually combining two separate photographs? As an unintended panorama. An unintended well. consequence, because you're, you're right. I think if you're, if, if you're thinking about shooting panoramas, which you know, many of us will have done, we have to shoot discrete pictures and, and join them up. And that's one of the the joys of digital technology it facilitates that and mm. and I think most people do accept that as a legitimate yeah. way of using yeah. digital photography but this was kind of um, fortuitous let's yes. say um, and I'm going to defend myself and say of course I would say this um, I do think it's legitimate but I do understand the arguments that there are yeah all right I mean I think with with the, the few seconds in between these it'd be very difficult to argue against it however uh, I'm not sure it would have made any difference if it was, if it was over two seconds. A lot, a lot of cases. You know, I suppose here's unless a, here's something significant had changed in the in the meantime. Well, there you go. I um, mean, I think here's the thought process. What what I realise now is, if I'd been more purist about it, I should simply have shot it with a wider lens, and cropped it. Yes. But the problem was that I, uh, and this is quite interesting, conceptually, I was, I get I get very uh, frustrated by. Uh, by framing that doesn't work for me in camera yeah so my workflow is always to try to frame in camera something where I could feel I could use the whole frame and so in order to have made this wider frame I would have had to include foreground elements that I didn't want or to have had to include the sky which would have, have created an unbalanced proportion yeah as I saw it so that's why that's why it worked out the way that it did well I'm glad you take took two pictures because that works very well for me Good. All right. Well, I think, I mean, it's, it seems strange, doesn't it, to go all the way to New Zealand and, and end up making a, a picture that looks kind of almost European. Um, and maybe, maybe that in itself says something about New Zealand. Um, I do wonder if it does. I think the fact that if that was in, uh, in Europe, that would be one of the most famous views uh, on the continent, probably. Well, it, it rightly so. Um, I think you're right, and that that does, and, and it's a very good point because I I do find that in New Zealand you you drive around and and there's so many places you think, wow, that's amazing, yeah. and and think, God, you you do certainly think, wow, if that was in the UK, that would be everyone would stop there and make yes. photographs, and that's not the case on the whole. And this is simply a stopping point on the way up to a ski station. It is not a, an identified stopping place. Yeah. There are no identified stopping places on that road. No, you just have to pull off and make it up somewhere safe on, and make yes. it up. Yeah, yeah. Which of course for us is a lovely thing. It's you feel like you're, you're discovering it. And yeah. in fact, Christian and Steve and I had scouted that viewpoint 
um, the day before our group arrived. Yeah. Um, so we were we were fairly confident it would work, but of course we could never have have, have uh, known that the light was going to yeah. be like that. And the clients thought you delivered it for them. The only problem with it was uh, the very first morning you're out there and you get that and you think, <laughs> oh, it can't get better than this, can it? And of course it didn't. Yeah. But we still had a great time. It was a pretty nice way to start, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Jeff. You're welcome.